Lecture nine begins. Lecture nine deals with the stress terms of single phase Navier-Stokes equation, formulation of continuity equation and the inertial term of equation motion has been completed in lecture eight. I will drive the first one using the control volume indicated by the sky blue square. For simplicity, assume the flow is two dimensional. In the two dimensional case, the control volume had thickness of one. So the control volume is V equal to delta X delta Y times one. The cross-sectional area of the side surface is given by multiplying the line segment delta X or delta Y by one. From now, I will formulate the first term on the right-hand side of the above equation. The capital letter F is used for the force acting on the control volume. The examples of the force are pressure force, viscous force, and external force, such as the gravitational force. The small letter F is used for the force per unit volume as shown in the above equation. Let's start with pressure. The pressure applied to the control volume is written in the figure. The pressure is normal force per unit area. Force act on the side surface is equal to pressure times the area of the side surface. In the equation of fluid motion, the independent variables are time t and coordinate x, y, g, z. The dependent variables, that is the unknown variables are velocity and pressure. To solve the equation of motion, the number of unknown variables must be equal to the number of given equation. So the viscous stresses must be expressed as function of velocity. From here, I will explain how viscous stresses are expressed as a function of velocity. <clears throat> the free velocity is free to deform. Deformation occurred because velocity u and v differ depending on the position. Resistance works against the rate of deformation per time. This resistance is the viscous stress. If the deformation takes place for a sufficiently long time, no force is required for the deformation. <clears throat> there are two types of deformation, distort and stretch. Both are caused by shear stresses. Compressible frees are deformed by expansion or contraction, but for the moment, Let's assume that the fluid is incompressible. <clears throat> Left figures show the case where the shear stresses tau x tau y act on the control volume of the sky blue rectangle and if transform the rectangle to the parallel line. The thickness of the control volume is one. Shear stress tau x acts along the OA plane and tau y acts on, along the OC plane. As a result, the control volume OABC transforms into the pink OA prime, B prime, C prime. The magnitude of deformation can be given by the amount of change in angle delta alpha plus delta beta. The right figure shows the case where the normal for shear stress sigma act on the control volume and stretches the square into a pink rectangle. In this situation, the shear stress tau y is generated on the OA and OC, OD planes. From the force balance, sigma is equal to tau. 
the magnitude of deformation can be given by delta theta. The rate of deformation is time derivative of angle. The last formula gives the shear stresses, stress, that is, the stress, shear stress is the rate of deformation multiplied by fluid viscosity. <clears throat> <clears throat> From here, I will try to express the shear stress by the velocity u and v. Let u and v uh, be the fluid velocity of the OA and OC surfaces. The velocity is indicated by a black arrow. Strictly speaking, the fluid velocities U and V change with the distance along the OA and OC, but the amount of change can be ignored as a higher order small term. The shear stresses indicated by the blue line, uh, blue line act on the surface surrounding this control volume. Let tau x be the shear stress on the OA surface and tau y be the shear stress on the OC surface. The A, B, and B, C planes are separated from the origin O by delta x and delta y. The velocities and the shear stresses of the O, A, B, and B, C plane differ from those of OA and OC by the distance. Suppose the control, uh, control volume is transformed into a pink parallelogram. The first relation hold, the first relation fold for the balance of the moment of around origin O. Neglecting the uh, Higher order, higher order small term, tau x and tau y are equal. Therefore, the shear stress is represented by one symbol tau, as shown earlier. And the deformation produces the angle delta alpha and delta beta. Write the sum of angle delta alpha plus delta beta as delta theta. <clears throat> As mentioned in the previous slide, the stress due to viscosity can be expressed by the change in deformation over time. The rate of deformation is given by the time derivative of the angle d theta dt. <clears throat> d theta dt can be rewritten as shown in the last line. Finally, tau can be represented by the velocity u and v as shown in the yellow frame. <clears throat> Derivation of the normal stress is a little more complicated than the shear stress. The square part of the upper right figure is shown in the right side on the left. The distance from the center to each side is capital S. The normal stress of sigma x acts on this square. <clears throat> the square is stretched into a red rectangle. The sum of the angular change, angular change due to deformation is the sum of the one half delta theta and one half delta theta. Shear stress tau is generated and act along the side OD and OA of the triangle. As shown in the yellow frame, <coughs> The shear stress tau is given by multiplying the time derivative of the angle by the disk viscosity. The blue 
triangle extend by delta S. <clears throat> delta S is expressed by multiplying round u round x by S delta T. Therefore, the relation in the red line frame is obtained. The areas of the blue shaded part and the red shaded part are the same because the fluid is incompressible. <clears throat> this can be expressed by the relation d d prime times s equal to d prime t e prime times d s. The area of the red shaded part is equal to d prime e prime times delta s. Substituting s minus d d prime d double prime for d prime e prime and omitting the higher order small term, d prime e prime times delta s becomes s times delta s. As the result. D prime E prime can be approximately equal to S. Substituting this for D prime E prime into the above equation yield D S equal D D prime over root two. Next, calculate the angle chain delta S. One half delta S is equal to D, D prime over O D. D, D prime is root of two times D S from the above equation. O D is root of two times S. Substituting root of two D S and root two S for D, D prime and O D one half delta theta is equal to delta ds over s. Putting above equation, uh, putting above result together, d theta dt can be expressed as two times round u round x. <clears throat> Substituting two round u round x, for the definition of the shear stress tau in the above yellow frame, the shear stress tau is expressed by U as shown in the last yellow frame. <clears throat> Next, we prove the shear stress tau and normal stress sigma are equal. The equation on the first line can be obtained from the balance of forces. The sum of OA squared and OD squared is equal to AD squared. Substituting this relationship into the above equation, you know that the shear stress and normal stress are equal. From the last equation in the previous slide, tau is equal to two mu round u round x. Since tau and sigma x are equal, delta x can be expressed by the equation in the yellow frame. Similarly, delta sigma y is expressed by the equation in the right frame. <clears throat> this is the summary of viscous stresses. First, shear stress. Second, normal stress. <clears throat> In some cases, the symbol delta sigma x is used for the sum of the normal viscous stress and the pressure. <clears throat> Representation of the inertial term has been given in lecture eight. The representation of pressure, normal viscous force, and shear stress has been given in the previous slide in this lecture. Now you are ready to derive the
the equation motion. Let's drive the equation motion using the control volume. Before that, the symbols that will, use, that will be used are shown in the blue frame on the right. First, pressure is indicated in the figures. Second, normal viscous stress. The third, shear stress. <coughs> Next, I will show the equation motion. The upper is uh, the upper is the equation in the x direction, and the lower is the, is the one in the y direction. The force terms are put on the right hand side. External forces, capital X and capital Y, are added in both equations. <clears throat> All forces acting on the control volume are shown in these figures. First, I will explain the force in the x direction. Pressure works perpendicular to OC and AB plane. The pressure on the, on the OC side works in the positive direction of x, and the pressure on the OAB side works in the negative direction. So Px is given as shown in the red line frame. The forces due to normal stress also act perpendicular to the OC and AB plane, but their directions are opposite to the pressure. So Fxn is given as shown in the second frame. The force Fx, Fxs due to the shear stress is shown in the third line, third red frame. The forces in the y direction, that is the pressure, normal viscous stress and shear stress can be expressed in the same way as in the case of x direction. <clears throat> the equations of motion in x and y directions are shown, where pressure, normal stress, and shear stress derived in the previous slide are uh, substituted. If we reduce the volume of delta x, delta y times one, and rewrite the above two, two equations using the symbol of substantial derivative du dt and dv dt, the equation motion is expressed by the form in the yellow frame. <clears throat> The equation of motion will be completed substituting sigma and the tau expressed by the velocity u and v. So far, we assume that the fluid is incompressible for simplicity. In the case of a compressible fluid, it is not enough to only consider the dependence of temperature and the pressure on the fluid density. A new term unique to compressible fluid is added to the stress term. I will explain from the next slide what kind of term must be added. <clears throat> As I have explained before, when the fluid element deforms, the resistance force works in the proportion to the change on in deformation over time. That resistance is the viscous stress. So far, I have assumed the fluid is incompressible and considered only shear strain and the deformation of the fluid. <clears throat> in the case of a compressible fluid, not only shear strain, but also deformation due to expansion or contraction occur. So in general, there are too many, two types of deformation. One is the shear strain and the other is expansion and contraction due to fluid compressibility. 
the rate of expansion and contraction is given by the divergence of fluid velocity. I will explain in the next slide that rate of expansion and contraction is given by the divergence of fluid velocity. If you don't know the meaning of the word divergent, refer to lecture two. <clears throat> in any deformation, resistance act against the change in deformation over time. Corresponding to the two types of deformation, there are two types of free viscosity corresponding to types of viscous stresses. Uh. One is the shear viscosity and the other is bulk vis viscosity or the second viscosity. What is called simply viscosity is usually the shear viscosity. The shear viscosity is used for the shear stress and normal stress. The expression of shear stress and normal stress have already been reduced in this lecture and they are shown in, in the yellow frame. Bark, the bark viscosity lambda is used for the volumetric viscous stress as shown in the pink frame, the volumetric viscous stress is expressed by the volume expansion, lambda dot u, multiplied by bulk viscosity lambda. <clears throat> the same volumetric stress is applied to all directions x, y, and z. In the next slide, I will explain that Navra dot u is the rate of expansion or contraction. The amount of volume expansion per unit time is defined as the volume expansion rate. Consider the volume expansion rate. Consider the control volume O, A, B, C as usual. Let delta X be the length of the CV control volume in the X direction. DY, delta Y be the length in the Y direction and U and V uh, be the velocity at point B, O. Velocities on the A, B, and the B, C side are shown by the equation in the black line frame. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, the velocity changes from A to B and from B to C, but such changes are omitted because such changes are higher order small terms. Since the velocities of a, B, and B, C plane are different from the velocity at the origin, the control volume expands or contract and become the yellow control volume. Here the figure is a case of expansion. Volume, volume expansion rate D can be expressed in this way. <clears throat> This is the equation for the two-dimensional case. The three-dimensional case, the three-dimensional equation is shown below the two-dimensional case. In the incompressible fluid, D equals zero. Nabla dot U is zero, is a continuity equation of incompressible fluid. As I said over and again, over and over again, the viscous, viscous stress is proportional to the volume deformation, volume deformation rate. 
in a compressible fluid. Fiscal stress act in the direction of perpendicular to the surface in addition to pressure. Coefficient applied to the formation rate is bulk viscosity. Bulk viscosity has not been investigated in detail compared with shear viscosity. It is zero for monatomic gas and 20, uh, 60 to 30 percent of shear viscosity for the atomic gas. Stokes assume the formula for the bulk viscosity in the yellow frame. This expression is called Stokes hypothesis. Since it is difficult to explain the meaning of this equation without understanding the stress tensor, the stress tensor of the flow field will be explained from the next slide. First, let's review scalars, vectors, and tensor. The tensor expression is indispensable to express the stress applied to the control volume. Scala expresses only quantity or magnitude. Example of a scala are mass, temperature, length, area, the volume, etc. Vector expresses direction in addition to quantity. Examples are velocity and force. The component u, small u, v, w of the vector u are scalar because they have not only magnitude. A stress tensor represents the magnitude of stress, direction of the stress, and the direction of the surface on which the stress acts. Direction of the sub, uh, stress and direction of the surface are indicated by subscript. Let's take tau yy and tau xz as examples. The first subscript indicate direction of the force. The surface also has a direction. The direction normal to the surface is defined as direction of the surface. The direction of the surface is indicated by the second subscript. In the left figure, direction of the yellow surface is Z, and the direction of the blue surface is Y. Therefore, in tau xx, Direction of the force is on the y-axis and direction of the surface on which the force acts is also on the y-direction. Such a stress is normal stress. In tau xz, xz, the direction of the force is on the x-axis and direction of the surface on which force acts is on the z-axis. Such a stress is shear stress. <clears throat> All components of the shear tensor are shown. <clears throat> the component of the stress tensor in the x direction are shown. The surface on which the stress, uh, stress acts is colored yellow. The surface direct direction is x in the left figure, y in the middle, and z in the right. <clears throat> the stress acting on the surface away from the origin changes with distance. For example, tau xy plus delta tau xy can be expressed as tau xy plus round tau xy round y times delta y. 
Next, all the components of the stress tensor in the X direction, the Y, Z direction are shown. Since the case of 3D, three dimensional, is shown here. There are nine stress tensors in total. But in the case of 2D, two dimensional, it is only the part surrounded by the red line. According to the symbols used earlier, tau xx correspond to sigma x, tau yy correspond to sigma y as well. <clears throat> now recall the story of volumetric viscous stress. In a cons compressive fluid, beside the pressure, the volumetric viscous stress act on the control volume in the direction perpendicular to the surface. This viscous stress is proportional to the rate of volume change. Change. All the components of viscous stress can be expressed by velocity component U, V, and W. <clears throat> Volumetric viscous stress is applied to the diagonal component of stress matrix because the diagonal component in the matrix is the stress acting in the direction normal to the plane. Previously, when I explained the viscous stress in a two-dimensional field, the stresses derived are stresses x tau xx, tau yy, tau xy, tau yx on this page. At that time, I used the symbol sigma x for tau xx and sigma y for tau yy. Here, all the stresses are unified with the symbol tau. Thus, the subscript tells you whether it is shear or normal. Each time that sandwich the diagonal component has the same expression. Such a matrix is called diagonal matrix. The sum of the diagonal component gives the equation in the red frame. The sum of diagonal component is zero in incompressible free because nabla dot u is zero for in compressive fluid. <clears throat> Stokes' hypothesis is that is, is to assume that the sum of diagonal component is zero in the com in, in the compressive fluid as well. So the bulk viscosity lambda is given using the shear viscosity as shown in the yellow frame. <clears throat> now, the three-dimensional equation motion for the complex of fluid is shown for each component. The inertial term or acceleration term is expressed as Substantial derivative. <clears throat> the shear uh, stress terms, the stress terms of x, y, and z direction are shown. It is found that subscript x, y, z are attached regularly. Using the Einstein's notation, stress terms in three directions can be represented by this single letter. One line in the yellow frame is enough for the equation motion for all three directions. <clears throat> The substantial derivative 
on the left side can be expressed below. <clears throat> the expression of the stress term using various component UVW looks quite complicated, but using Kronecker delta, all the component can be expressed concisely by one form. The Kronecker delta is represented by the symbol delta ij. If i and j are different, then delta ij is zero. And if they are equal, delta ij equal one. Now you can see how the tensor notation makes it easier to display expression. <clears throat> Substituting the expression by the various component UVW for each term of the viscous stresses tau, RJ, tau, tau IJ, the, and rearranging them, the Navier Stokes equation can also be written as follows. When using vector notation, the above three equations can be written like this. When using tensor notation, the above three equations can be written like this. For incompressible fluid, the term in the red line frame is zero. As shown so far, the Navier Stokes equation formula is written in the various forms. This lecture I'm arranged for those who are not familiar with vector and tensor notation. And so I have explained this notation in detail. I hope you find now that this notation is very convenient for writing equation with many components. This is the end of lecture nine. Thank you.